Building, battling, and becoming. Somebody say becoming. Come on, how many people you just want to become all that God wants you to be? But how many people know to get there in that ongoing process, there's some building and some rebuilding and some battling you have to go through to become all that God wants you to be? We're in the book of Nehemiah. I'm going to kind of do a quick review, and then we're going to dive right in. And our main thought for this whole series of building, battling, becoming is, and I want you to hear this, it's kind of the main point, that it is not the will of God for any of us to live in the ruins of our past and the rubble of our mistakes and failures. I want to say that again. It is not, somebody say not. It is not the will of God for any of us in this room to live in the ruins of our past or the rubble of our failure. It is the will of God that each and every one of us would walk in wholeness, would walk in peace, would walk, come on, walk in shalom, as Dr. Hill talked about at the beginning of March, that we'd walk in the fullness of God, that we'd walk in life, that we'd walk in joy, hello, that we just walk in all that God has for us. But we have a, a, a lot of times for believers, we can say it is not the will of God for us to live that way, but a lot of people, that is their MO in life, their method of operation. They live and walk from a place of misery and pain and brokenness Instead of walking from a place of healing, wholeness, and joy. Are you with me this morning? Our God is not only a rebuilding God, He's a restoring God. Hello, that's worth a big amen. I want to say it again. Our God is not only a rebuilding God, He is a restoring God. Some of you have lost friendships over things through the years. I believe that our God, and I believe you believe this deep in your soul, I believe our God is big enough that He can even restore lost friendships. It's a little quiet on that one. Because I think a, a lot of times we write off people before God is wanting us to ever write off people. Actually, I've never known God to write off anyone. God is a restoring God. He's a rebuilding God. He's a renewing God. Hello. That's our God. And we don't have to have the MO, the method of operation of damaged, broken, um, wounded, always offended. That is not the will of God for any of us in the room. That's not the will of God for you, for your marriage, or for your family. It's not the will of God for me. And that brings us to Nehemiah. This whole book is about rebuilding broken things. Rebuilding broken things. But the real result of the, of the rebuilding is restoration. Rebuilding is not the end. Restoration is the end. So, real quick review. Israel finds himself in a dark place in history. And God calls a man, Nehemiah, to rebuild his homeland, the city of Jerusalem. But more importantly, God uses Nehemiah to bring restoration and revival to the people of Israel. Let me just tell you real quick about Nehemiah, because again, I know we have different people here at different weeks. Nehemiah was a Jew, started off as a slave, somehow got promoted by God, of course, promoted him to a place of servant, and he became the cupbearer to the king, the king. And so he and his team were the cupbearers, and at that time, it was a really high official position. It was an, a position of honor, it was a position of comfort, he actually got paid. I mean, it was, it was a great position except that every day you were testing wine to make sure it wasn't poisoned. So that's the part that maybe not so good. I'd be asking like, hey, what are the benefits here? You know, if I, but, but anyway, so that's what he and his team had to do. They always tasted everything before it got to the king. He was a confidant. History tells us that these type positions, they were a confidant to the king. The king trusted them. And you can see from reading Nehemiah that the king had some serious respect for Nehemiah. The favor of God was on Nehemiah's life. Well, one day, Nehemiah... His brother, his actual brother, and a few friends come in town from, from Jerusalem. And, of course, as any person, a sweet reunion. I just had my folks here. It's this wonderful, sweet reunion when you see family. But this was not a sweet reunion because his brother goes to tell him, like, hey, things are not going well back home at all. Actually, everything is in a state of rubble and ruin and ash. And Nehemiah, when hearing this news, he is confronted with things in his soul. And he is brokenhearted, and he is convicted, and he is burdened that somebody's got to do something. 
And so Nehemiah immediately goes into, and this is what we should all do when we have things that are burning our heart. He goes immediately to a season of prayer and fasting. And he, and he prays and he seeks God and he fasts and he just seeks the Lord. And the Bible tells us for four months, he's just praying and he's fasting and he's just seeking God. And he's just waiting for an opportunity for God to use him. Because he's praying those prayers like, God, first he checked his own heart and then he's like, God, use me. Use me. And so he, he, that's going on. And I don't know about you, but if you're waiting for any long period of time, I mean, we're, come on, we're in an instant society day like never before. Four months in the grand scheme of eternity, that's not very long. But when you're waiting for something, it can be a long time. And he is waiting for four months. And then on that fateful day, it was a God day. He woke up that morning. And the man that was so burdened and so convicted could no longer hold his emotions in check. Of course, as a cupbearer, you were not supposed to show your emotions at all. You're supposed to be happy and positive. And, and, uh, but he cannot hold in anymore what's going on in his heart. And so Nehemiah uh, is, is, is down. He's physically down. He's emotionally down. The king, the observant king, notices Nehemiah. And he's like, Nehemiah, what's going on? You're not sick. You, you look really deep. The Bible says you look deeply troubled. And Nehemiah says to the king with a little whisper to heaven, like, oh, Lord, don't let me cut, you know, die right here. He says, oh, king, if it honors you and pleases you, I just have to tell you the truth. My heart is broken over my homeland. And the king says an incredible response to him. He says, how can I help? And then literally, it's a God conversation that he is blessed to go. And I want us to pick it up there now. At Nehemiah chapter 2. Look at verse 7. That's where we're going to pick up. If you don't have your Bible in front of you, we have it on the screens. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 7. And it says this, I also said to the king, so he's already asked the king if he can go, and the king said yes. Verse 7, I also said to the king, if it please the king, I want you to look at the audacity right here of Nehemiah. If it please the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through the territories on my way to Judah. Because between uh, Persia and Judah, was enemies everywhere. But if he had a letter from the king, no one would touch him. He was untouchable. And then he says this, verse 8, and please, so he's asking for another letter, and please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, the manager of your forest, look at this, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. So basically he's telling the king, you're going to pay for the rebuilding process. That's some bold audaciousness right there. And look what he says right here. I needed to make beams for the gate of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and for a house for myself. <laughs> he probably whispered that one real quick. I needed for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and for a house for myself. And, and the king, look at this, and the king granted these requests. Because, why? Because he was an eloquent speaker? No, because the gracious hand of God was on me. Because the gracious hand of God was on me. Do you know what that is, people? That's called favor. Let me just tell you about favor real quickly. Favor is something that you and I could never do in our own strength. It's a supernatural graciousness that God bestows upon people that are in his will. And he favors you among men. You couldn't do it, but God does it. That's called the favor of God. How many people would love to walk in the favor of God? Well, can I tell you what? You're a child of God, so you can walk in the favor of God. Make sure you just stay in the will of God. Hello. And the king, I love this, and the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. Now, the reason you see the word me there is this is written personal tense. This is almost like a journal. It's like a memoir. Nehemiah is writing this. And so he, he, you see the favor of God on him. And then look at, look at verse 10. Last, verse 9, I'm sorry. When I came to the governors of the province of the west of Euphrates, so he's got the letters with him. When I came to the governors of the province of the west of the Euphrates River, I delivered the king's letters to them. Can you imagine how good he was feeling? Here you go, guys. You can't touch me. Can't touch this. You know, he literally just gave, here's my letters. He gives the letters to them. I delivered the king's letter to him. The king, I should add, and look at this. Look at the favor of God. He didn't even ask for this. The king, I should add, had sent along army officers and horsemen to protect me. 
So he's got favor all on him. But when Samballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of my arrival, they were very displeased. Look at the wording here. They were very displeased that someone had come to help the people of Israel. They were very displeased that someone had come to what? Help. Somebody say help. Help the people of Israel. Can I tell you this morning, we'll stay in that scripture there. We're going to go there in just a moment. The enemy can't stand the rebuilding process of God. Because the enemy knows that the end result is restoration. It starts in rebuilding, but it ends in restoration. And I remind you what the biblical definition of restoration is, is better than before. Better than before. Full restoration. Look it up. Study it. The full restoration of God is better than before. But it starts in a rebuilding place. It starts in a, in a quiet place. It starts with you and God or you and your marriage. A rebuilding can be a whole bunch of things. It can be your life as an individual. It can be your marriage. It can be your family. It can be a church. It can be, it can be whatever. It can be an organization. It could be a business. I know we have many entrepreneurs here that you bought a business and you rebuilt that business. And because you're a Christian, you gave that business to God and God used you to bless that business. And by the way, I want to remind you, God blesses us so that we can be a blessing. It's all for His glory. So the rebuilding and the restoration process, it's God smiling down on it. But the enemy hates it. And there were two real men who had really weird names, all right? Sembalat and Tobiah, they were displeased. And I want to tell you what, they were thorns in Nehemiah's flesh the rest of this book. They did everything but mock and even said, they even said, hey, meet me in the back and we're going to have a fight and we're going to kill. I mean, they did everything because the enemy wants people to stay broken. Listen to me. The enemy wants people to stay damaged goods. The enemy wants us to live in offense. The enemy wants you to be hurt and angry. And he would love you to be angry at Christians or the church or leadership. The enemy would love that. He would lo- he would, the enemy would love for you never to reconcile with friends that you used to have. I want to tell you what, just recently we got an email from someone we've not heard from in 10 years. And I went to this brother and his wife and kids, and I apologized to them about something many, many, many years ago. Something that, you know, that I was involved with, that I just felt like the Lord told me, you need to go to them and make it right. And he would not receive me at that time. Because I, in, regarding the leadership of that church, and the church just went through a painful time. It was just, ah, oh, it was bad. I can't stand church splits and crap like that. It's just, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, uh, but that's what a church split is. I, I just can't find the biblical, uh, anyway, don't get me going on that, sorry. Uh, so I went to this man just because I was a leader on the staff, and I just felt like somebody needs to go to people. So I just went to him and I just said, hey, I, I just got to tell you, I'm so sorry for what's happened. And uh, he, he, you know, he was kind and gracious, but basically said, get out. And, uh, and so we just heard from him. Hadn't heard from him in 10 years. And he said, I am taking a position in a church, and I cannot take this position until I repent to you and Lisa. You came to my home, and I would not receive you nor receive your apology for the church. And he said, I just have to tell you, I'm so sorry. And when you come this way, please come visit us. I'd love you to meet my family. And I want to tell you what, like, I broke down when I got that email because I never thought I would hear from this person again and I wasn't holding something like, he better, ever, he better, apo-. I, we can't be like that. People, we can't be a record of wrong holding the record over people's heads. I just learned most people don't apologize. But that, ta- you know what? We take the high road and we apologize. We take the high road and we repent. We take the high road and we just let these things, we let them go. We let it go because we can't stay broken people. And this, this young man now in his thir- late 30s was convicted by God. He says that in the email. I can't take this office without letting you know I'm so sorry. And I've seen through the years friendship just disappear from people. And I'm like, God, where are you in the middle of all this? And God's like, I want to restore it. 
I want to bring healing to it. And I just think a lot of times we get in the, in the way and in the middle of all that. Hello. The enemy wants us to stay down. He wants us to live in our pain and misery. And here's a lie from the enemy. Let me just say this to you real quick. The enemy would love for you and I to think that the pain and misery that we've experienced in life, that's just our lot in life. Or he would love you to get a little closer to it and make it your identity. The enemy would love for you, and you and I, we've all experienced pain, okay, in church and out of church. But he would love for you to make that a part of your identity. What had happened when you were a little girl or when you were a little boy? What happened when you were a young person, a teenager, or a college student, or in your early 20s when you just got on fire for God and you got hurt? either by family or by a leader. or by You got hurt by it, and it has become part of who you are. And can I tell you what? None of what I'm talking about goes with the identity of Jesus Christ. God wants to heal us from the inside out. He wants to do a rebuilding in us and a restoring in us. It doesn't mean you're going to agree with everybody. I don't agree with my wife about everything. And I think we're happily married. I hope we are, you know, but... But I'm just, I mean, I'm just saying, come on, let's be real about this. No one talks about this in church anymore, and I'm tired of it. We've got to be a people that go there. And I'm not talking about you always going and confront somebody. I'm talking about you and I going to the Lord saying, God, deal with me. I noticed about Nehemiah, you know what the rebuilding process started? In him. Before he ever got sent out, he said, Father, I have sinned. You know what he was saying? I'm a part of the problem. Nehemiah was in a comfy position. He could have just stayed there, heard the news. Like many people, oh, that's too bad. Ooh, somebody needs to do something. But he was broken hard upon hearing this news. And something came alive in him. It's called conviction of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us in Nehemiah, I, I've already preached on this, but I'm just repeating it first to get on the same page. The Bible tells us that Nehemiah got with the Lord, and before he ever started praying for his homeland, he was checking his own heart. Father, forgive me, I have sinned. He even called his family out. Father, my whole family sinned. His family's over there going, what are we talking about? You know, he's, he's just calling out his family. We've sinned. I've sinned. So the rebuilding, and let me just say this to you. The rebuilding of Israel, it wasn't really about the walls. It was about the people of Israel. The walls, yes, needed to be rebuilt. But really what needed to be rebuilt was the hearts of the people of Israel. God wanted his kids back. You, you know, and I think, honestly, I look at it, and I, this is just me, I, when, I, when I'm reading between lines, I think the walls are a spiritual parallel of the hearts of Israel. When I look at those walls that are in rubble, in ruin and ash, the people of Israel were slaves and servants they were all just everywhere scattered. And God used Nehemiah, rebuilt first in him. And literally God used Nehemiah and a team of people to rebuild the people of Israel. And the end result was Israel went into a revival. Can I tell you what? The revival of God that's going to come to the church in the latter days doesn't start with a group of people. It starts with me. It starts with you. It starts in our own hearts. I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again because it's relevant to the point. I had so many parents through the years ask me, how do I get my kids on fire? How do I get the kids on fire? And I said, you get on fire first and let them watch you burn. You get on fire for God. And some would be like, oh, I can't believe you're telling me that. I'm like, I'm just telling you the truth. It starts with us as parents. It starts with you, mom. It starts with you, dad. And we're, we're praying prayers for the church, and God's like, I want you. You're a part of the church. Are you with me this morning? I'm telling you, Nehemiah was so burdened and convicted that when he heard the report of his homeland, he was willing to give up the life of privilege in the palace to live a life of service in rebuilding his homeland. He saw rubble and ruin, and he said, somebody's got to do something. But here's what we got to know and recognize. When you start the process of rebuilding, you're going to always have a Tobiah or a Sambalai, and it's not people. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. Hello. It's the enemy. The enemy would love for you to wrestle with people. 
And you're like, well, Pastor Chris, it's the people that are causing the problem. Can I just tell you what? The Bible says we wrestle not with flesh and blood. When someone does something to you, can I encourage you? I know at first it hurts. You get angry about it. You go through the gamut of emotions. But then I want to encourage you, as the Lord encourages me to do this, bless them. Forgive them. And then bless them again. Bless them. You're like, bless the person that hurt me? Yes. Jesus says to love those who hurt you, to bless them. Jesus said to pray for them. Don't let it get in and make a poison in your heart where poison parks because poison kills. And poison definitely puts out the fire of God in our lives. Pat Damani says this. He says, when we are operating according to God's will and carrying out His plans, we are almost always going to face opposition. I want to say that again. When we are operating according to God's will and carrying out His plans, we are almost always going to face opposition. Now, I want to go back. I want to park on something just for a moment uh, about those four months. Somebody say, four long months. Four long months. Again, in the grand scheme of eternity, that's nothing. But when you're waiting for something, man, one month can be long. Hello. Something happened in those four months in Nehemiah. You know what I'm talking about, right? The four months before the king said, how can I help? He heard the news, and for four months, Nehemiah was praying, he was fasting, he was seeking God, he was dealing with his own heart, and he was asking God for a chance. Now, I believe God did something pretty crazy in those four months in Nehemiah my terminology, but I mean, I believe that in those four months of praying and waiting, that God began to give Nehemiah a vision and a plan for rebuilding Jerusalem. I'll prove that to you biblically in just a moment before we close out. I want to say that again. While Nehemiah was waiting and he thought God was doing nothing, this is speaking to someone right now, you are in the waiting place. You are waiting for something. And Nehemiah was waiting and waiting, God, use me, God, use me, God, use me. And while he was waiting... For God to do something so he could go, God was instilling in Nehemiah a vision and a plan. A vision, and here's what Nehemiah, and this is what I want to just kind of get in your heart this morning before we close. See, Nehemiah started getting a vision of Jerusalem already rebuilt. The walls were down. Things were rubble. Things were ash. There was all kinds of stuff. But Nehemiah was getting a vision in the waiting, and he was seeing Jerusalem not as it was, but as it will be. That's what vision is all about. Vision is not seeing what is. Vision is seeing what will be. And God was lowering in, depositing in Nehemiah a vision. Somebody say vision. It's huge. Are we, are we understanding this? Like literally, like Nehemiah was getting a vision of God. And a vision, a lot of times people can say it's like a mental picture or it's like, a, it's like a painting in your mind or it's an image or something. But Nehemiah didn't see the walls down. He saw the walls up. Can I tell you what? Wherever you're at in life right now and whatever your problem you are fighting through, and I include myself in that, don't look at the problem through your eyes and your vision. Look at it through God's eyes and his vision. God sees the end. We see the immediate. Nehemiah had some work to do. They literally say, we've got work to do later on. But literally, God, he sees the other side of whatever we're going through. He already knows what's there. And we've got to get the vision. Somebody say vision. We've got to get the vision of God for where we're going, for what we're supposed to do. In Nehemiah, the walls were down. Oh, Lord, if we can get this in our hearts. The walls were, okay, in the physical, the walls were down. The city was a mess. It was rubble everywhere. But Nehemiah saw the walls in his mind and heart already rebuilt. And God was giving him a plan to how to rebuild it. A vision and a plan. We've got to recognize this and understand this. Andy Stanley says this, vision Vision, excuse me, are born in the soul of a man or a woman who is consumed, look at this language here, who is consumed with the tension between what is, I love this, and what could be. Visions are born in the soul of a man or a woman who is consumed with the tension between what is, and say it with me, and what could be. 
Again, he wasn't seeing Jerusalem as she was. He was seeing her as she will be. But at the same time, God was giving Nehemiah like this really cool, fully developed architectural plan of how to do this. That's why when the king asked him, what do you need? What, how can I help? He said, I need a letter for this. I need a letter for that. By the way, you're going to give me all your trees. I need this. I need that. He was telling him. He was ready. He was, it was cooking inside of him. If you've ever had an idea and a dream or a vision that God's given you, have you noticed a lot of time it cooks before God releases you to do it? God marinates dreams and visions in people. And if we ever get ahead of God and we just kind of do the vision because we want to do it, it doesn't work out. But if we let it sit and then God says, go, then you see the vision come to reality. Church, I want you to know that the elders and myself are praying before the Lord and we're asking God for a new vision of where God would have us to go. We're saying, God, would you show us where you want us to go? We don't want to get ahead of you. We don't want to get too slow. We want to follow your vision for this house. Because church, without vision, we perish. Without vision, you just wither up. And vision's not just for a church. Vision's for a family. Vision's for a marriage. The planning of God, the vision of God. We need these things in our lives. Gosh, you're quiet this morning. You got, I mean, I, I know it's cold and you hate it, but come on. It, it, we we got to recognize and understand this. that liter, Literally, Nehemiah, yes, Nehemiah was, if you look at it in one sense, yes, he was rebuilding the walls, okay? God used him to rebuild Jerusalem. Took rubble and rebuilt everything. And man, it was a lot of work. And they did it in supernatural record time. But more than that, it was about the hearts of the people. It was all about the people. God was rebuilding the walls through Nehemiah, but he really wanted his people to be rebuilt. Because the end goal with God is people. When we pray for Northwest, we pray for people of all ages. When we pray for Emmanuel, I I never think about the building. I pray for the people. When we pray for the city of Omaha, I'm never thinking about anything but the people. And by the way, this week, I don't know if you saw the paper or you read online, but we had a lot of violence take place in our city this week. And there's a lot of violence that takes place here a lot, period. And we were praying in this room yesterday, to God, would you remove this vile, violent spirit from our city? And can I tell you what? Thank God for our policemen and our firemen and for our mayor and all of them. Thank God for them. But can I tell you what? Who I believe is really going to make a difference? The church. The church is the one who will bring in the light in dark areas. It's the church's responsibility because it's all about people. Anybody ever heard of Jim Sabala, pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle? Beautiful church. If you ever go to New York City, I would recommend two churches you visit. There's a bunch of great churches there. But Times Square Church, David Wilkerson's old church, and then go to Brooklyn Tabernacle. And by the way, I would encourage you, don't go to their normal service, even though it's wonderful. Go to their prayer service. I have never seen anything like it in my life. If you ever go to New York City, go to the prayer service. The guy, the tour guide told us, you need to get there about two hours early. I was like, for a prayer meeting? He's like, yes. We got there an hour and a half. The line was wrapped around the huge building of people waiting to get in. We barely got in the sanctuary. We actually forced ourselves in there. But anyway, that's another story. Because I'm like, I'm getting in where, you know. And uh, I had like 30 teenagers and five adults like, come on, kids, you know, getting in there. And I'm telling you, from the moment it was two hours of prayer service, and it felt like it was 20 minutes. The place was packed. Every seat was packed. And the people in there were crying out to God. And I mean, I remember I walked away like, I don't think I know how to pray. (laughs) You know, just like, Lord. And it was everybody in the room. I mean, it was like, And there were a bunch of guests like us there. I will never forget it. Well, this quote came across my path this week about people. Somebody say people. And this is from Pastor Pastor Jim Sabala. He says this, God's heart is for everybody. If we don't want to have everyone God God loves come into our churches, if we're not praying and open to loving anyone in the street for whom Christ died, no matter their color or background, no matter what they smell like or where they live or don't live, If we don't love like that, then let's not call ourselves a Christian church. Because all we're doing is cluttering up the landscape and providing a horrible false advertisement for Jesus. 
He says, if we don't want everybody to come in, how dare we mention the name of Jesus? If we only want white people or black people or young people or people who are in the middle class or folks with a certain level of education, that is not a Christian church because Christ died for everyone. It's all about people. The walls had to be rebuilt, yes, but what God really wanted was his kids back. And I'm telling you, if you're like me and you have a story where you wandered away from God, and God, I use the language, arrested my heart, there is no going back after he gets you. Because life with Christ is so much better than life without Christ. God wanted my heart, and he wanted your heart, and God wants this community's heart, and he wants every every kid's heart at that school and every teacher's heart over there. And God wants your neighbor's hearts, and he wants the people you encounter every day. He wants their hearts, and I believe that that rebuilding process of our community and our city, it starts with us, church, and we start to get a vision, and we start to get a plan. And God does a work in me and in you and in us as a church. It starts with us. Just as it started with Nehemiah, it starts with us. To end this, look down at your scripture there. Chapter 2, we're still in the same chapter. Nehemiah, is, he's made it all the way to Jerusalem. Oh, it's such a mess. It's such a mess and there's such devastation that some of the camels they're riding, they can't even go any further because of the rubble. That's how bad it was. And in Nehemiah 2.12, he says this. This is how we know God was doing something in his heart way before him. He says, look at on the screen here. I have not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. But then he calls the leaders together. Look at verse 17 because of time. He said, but now I said to them. He called the leaders together. Look at the, look at the verbiage here. Stay with me. Last few minutes. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble. Say that word with me. We are in. So he's already saying, hey guys, I'm a part of the problem, but I'm also going to be a part of the solution. You know very well what trouble we are in. Now he's going to have some brutally honest conversation. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. And here's his language again. Look at this. Let us rebuild, us, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and in this disgrace. Can you hear the passion in his voice? Well, not really, you hear it in mine, but you know what I'm saying? Like, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and in this disgrace, exclamation point. And then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. And they replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they begin the good work. Somebody say good work. Hey, when you're doing a rebuilding process, whether it's your heart, your life, your marriage, or whatever, it's a good thing. It's a God thing. But it was a lot of work. We know that the walls were 40 feet high, 8 feet thick, and almost 4 miles long. And it all had to be done by hand. 40 feet high, 8 feet thick. I mean, I'm 6 foot tall, and there's a lot of more men in here tall than me. 8 feet thick thick and then literally all the way around it almost four miles long a lot of work all done by hand and of course final verse right here with the enemy he does puts his ugly head in again look at this 19 but when Sambalat, tobiah oh look they have another little friend Sambalat, tobiah and geshem so they've have you noticed that they'll always be they'll get the group of people together hey 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 They'll always get people together. But when Sembalat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab heard of our plan, so what plan? The plan to rebuild. They scoffed continuously, contemptually. What are you doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? They knew he wasn't. He already had the letters. Look at Nehemiah's response. Last thought today. He says this, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall. He's speaking to the enemy. But look at this, this is so good right here. But you have, he's speaking to these guys, but you have no share, no legal right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Can I just tell you this morning? 
The enemy, if you're, if you're a son or daughter of the king, the enemy has no legal right in your life. He has no legal right in your marriage. He has no legal right in your family. Someone said a long time ago, the only permission the enemy has in a believer is the, excuse me, the only power that the enemy has in a believer is the permission you give him. Because he's been defeated. All his teeth have been pulled out. All he can do is gum you to death. I've said it before. He's a mouse with a microphone. And he can make a lot of rad, a loud racket and noise. But greater is Jesus that's in us than he that's in the world. And we have to understand and recognize that we walk in a place of victory and life with God. And that no matter what comes our way. And I love, he, Nehemiah tells him. You're like, well, Chris, that's a book of history. Yes, it's a book of history, but it's also speaking to us today. That when you're trying to move forward with God with intentionality, and you're trying to move forward with God in seeking His face and dealing with the hurts in your life, can I just tell you, the enemy, he's going to creep in his ugly head, but he has no legal right. Come on, let's pray together.